It's another episode of the Accounting Influencers Podcast with me, Rob Brown, where we bring on guests from all over the world that have something to say to the accounting and the finance world. And it's always great to bring on entrepreneurs that understand a little bit of the dilemmas that accountants have in wanting to be more entrepreneurial and really get their heads into the business owner space. So Nathan Hirsch, welcome to the show. Rob, thanks so much for having me. Am I the first non-bookkeeper, non-accountant to come on your show? No, actually, we don't interview a lot of accountants. We interview the influences of accountants. So kind of people like you in a way that have something to say. But yeah, some of our guests are qualified CPAs, qualified bookkeepers. So they understand a bit about that world. But it seems like you've got a foot in both camps with your accounts balance company. Tell the audience a little bit about your background, Nathan. Yeah. So I was a big Amazon seller. I started a Amazon dropshipping business out of my college dorm room back in 2008, 2009. If you could imagine me with more hair as a single college guy selling baby <laughs> products out of my college frat house, uh, that was me. And it was a lot of fun. My partner and I, we were young entrepreneurs making good decisions, bad decisions, not really knowing what we were doing. Uh, but one of the issues that we really had was hiring. College kids were very unreliable, and that brought us to the wonderful world of virtual assistants and, and freelancers. And we built up this VA army to help us run that, that Amazon business. Well, Amazon started getting harder and harder, and more people started selling. And we started offering these VAs and freelancers to other sellers. And that became my next business, the Free Up Marketplace, a competitor to Upwork and Fiverr. And with the Amazon business, we struggle with bookkeeping. I was doing it myself. I hired college kids to do it. I dumped it on my CPA at the end of the year. I tried hiring someone quarterly. And then towards the end, I gave up and said, hey, I need a bookkeeper every single month. So when I started free up, the first hire we made was a, a bookkeeper from day one. And that ended up being one of the best decisions I've ever made. Four years down the line, when we sold the company, we had four years of immaculate books to help us pass due diligence. And along the way, it helped us make good decisions based on what the numbers were actually telling us, which helped us scale. So we learned a valuable lesson of the importance of bookkeeping. And after we sold the company, COVID hit, we were kind of in a weird spot. All our travel plans were canceled. So we started building other businesses. We started Outsource School, which is our membership that teaches people our hiring process and our two bookkeeping brands, Accounts Balance and Ecom Balance, one for e-commerce, one for um, B2B online businesses, uh, just because we, we knew the, the effects of good bookkeeping. We did a lot of market research on, on what other bookkeepers struggle with, like hiring, scaling, marketing, SEO, a lot of stuff on paper that, that we're good at. And uh, yeah, the rest is history. It's been fun building a, a bookkeeping business while, while not actually being a bookkeeper myself. It sounds quite a ride. And we're seeing in our ecosystem, Nathan, that the role of a bookkeeper is not just becoming more and more important, but more and more recognized for business owners as they navigate tough economic climates, so lots, lots of uncertainties in what's going on in the world. We come out of the pandemic now. Talk to us about, and you've hinted at it a little bit, but how integral a bookkeeper is to a business owner and entrepreneur. Yeah, I mean, th there's a lot of reasons to, to have good bookkeeping. I mean, if you ever want to sell a company, you're not going to be able to do it without clean books. So our due diligence was six months long. It was the, the most stressful six months of my life. And that's with clean, immaculate books. I can't even imagine what it would have been like <laughs> if I had to pay a bookkeeper at that time to, to go back four years and, and clean everything up. Um, if you ever want funding or investment, you need clean books. Tax season comes around every year. It's way less stressful if you're doing your books every single month instead of waiting to the end of the year. But a lot of companies don't get investments. They don't sell. The, the real reason to do bookkeeping from my side is decision making. You, you need to be making decisions based on what the numbers are actually telling you, not off gut, not off looking at money going to your bank account. What are the actual margins? What are the actual trends in your business? And Connor and I have created this monthly finance meeting that we've run every month for the past six plus years. If you go to econbalance.com slash agenda, uh, you can actually grab our exact agenda. And we just have a monthly process. The month ends by the 10th to the 15th, we get our report, income statement, balance sheet, cash flow from our bookkeeper. We go through it line by line. We compare this month to last month, this month to the same month last year. And we make decisions based on what the numbers are telling us. That's the meeting that we decide, hey, are we going to hire someone? Are we going to cut back on ads? Or whatever decisions we're going to make get done at that meeting. And I think it takes a little bit of a, a veteran entrepreneur to get in that mindset instead of just waking up every day and, and just making guesses because you don't really understand your numbers. So let me ask a naive question. For an entrepreneur, what is the 
difference between a bookkeeper and, an, and a CPA, a, a qualified accountant, in terms of what they do and can do for you? So I, the way that I think of it is you got accounting. Accounting is the, the big umbrella. Everything falls under accounting. Okay. Then you've got your, your bookkeeper and your bookkeeper is not there to consult with you. They're not there to tell you whether you should be an S corp or a C corp. They're not there to file your taxes. They're there to, to, to reconcile accounts inside QuickBooks or Zero and get you your books on time every single month in a format that you can read that makes sense. They don't just take all expenses and put them together. They break them down in a way so you can actually see how much you're spending on software versus ads versus different things. So that's the role of a bookkeeper. Then you've got your CPA or tax person. They're the ones that should be helping you with tax strategy, filing your taxes. They should be setting you up as a C-Corp, an S-Corp. They should be consulting you whether you should be cash or accrual. Those are all things you go to your CPA for, even though your bookkeeper might have some tax experience, the, the CPA is who you go to for those questions. And then finally, you've got your CFO that usually comes into place once you're 5 million and above, they can be full-time, outsourced, partial, whatever it is, but they're there to help you make decisions. They're there to take the numbers from the books and help you forecast sales, forecast cash, decide should you hire someone. That's where the business consulting really comes in. And you want to keep all three in their own lane. You don't want to be asking your bookkeeper what kind of corporation you should be. You don't want to overpay your CPA to do the books. They've got their own deadlines they're going to fall behind on. They're, they're going to do things in a way to file taxes, but not necessarily to, to put things in a way for you to understand. And your CFO usually isn't the right person to ask tax strategy or, or file your taxes. So very important that you keep each one in their lane. That is a brilliant way of putting it. I love the way you've explained that. So as an entrepreneur, you need people on your team bus to help you build a robust business and grow it. And I can see how they're all swimming in their lanes. Your key professional advisors are all really, really good at what they do. One of the calls for CPAs and accountants these days is to be less backward and historical looking and reporting on what's happened already and more strategic and forward thinking. How important is that for an entrepreneur? Yeah, I mean, it's incredibly important. When a business, I think it's very easy to look at like what's going well, what are all my opportunities? Where could I be if everything goes right? Yeah. But I almost take the opposite approach. Like business is hard, businesses fail, threats come up all the time. And at the end of the day, all you're doing is making educated guesses. Even the best entrepreneurs don't know that their ideas or decisions are going to work. And past success doesn't necessarily mean future success. Just because I sold free up uh, doesn't mean that the next business I start is going to grow that big, that I'm going to do make all the right decisions there. So you have to keep that in mind. And I think your numbers really are your numbers and projecting numbers are really there to to look at what could go wrong are your margins going in the wrong direction are you hiring too fast are you wasting money on software that you don't need that, that you can consolidate those are kind of what i'm looking for and then when the right opportunities come up take it taking advantage of them whether it's hiring a, a new uh, marketing person or, or upgrading someone on your team something like that um that, that's kind of how i approach it as an entrepreneur if accountants are going to be more entrepreneurial in their thinking and get into the head of a business person, we know they need to be proactive and, and think like you and ask the right questions. I would imagine, though, that you as a client of an accountant, uh, you're a tough ask because there is so much that you want and so much that you know. Are you an easy client for an accountant or are you, do you make it really tough on them and, and have very high standards of what you want from them? Um, I have high standards. I, I don't necessarily think I make it tough on them. I hope I'm not. I mean, the one thing that I will not put up with is poor communication. If someone, right. if I have to chase someone down to get an answer, or if I ask a question and don't get a direct response, very tough for me to, to work with that person. And that's everything from someone on my team to my bookkeeper to the property manager of the condo I rent. Like if, if, there, if the poor communication is something that I can't get over. Now, th there's a difference between communication and being demanding. If I send someone an email and say, hey, can I get a report that says X, Y, Z? As long as I get a response that says, hey, I'll do it. I need a week or something. That's fine. Any kind of like instant request that I demand immediately, that's what kind of crosses the line. And that's the expectation that we set with our clients too. 
if you need something and you reach out to us, we're always going to respond within a business day. If we didn't, it probably went to spam. You should follow up. You should let someone on our team know. But that doesn't mean that we'll do everything instantly. We'll respond back and say, hey, we're looking into the request. We'll get back to you within a day or 48 hours or we need a week or we need to get past the, the 15th. So to me, it's the communication that's key. And I think a lot of people mix up like the instant demand versus just good communication skills. Yeah, we're going to get you on another episode to talk about the entrepreneurial journey that an accountant might make if they want to go out on their own. How did they make that first hire? We know that there's a lot of movement in the accounting profession. People are coming out of public accounting firms and that implied rule and saying, I want to do my own thing. I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to start my own bookkeeping or accounting business. And there's a lot that you've got to say on interviewing and onboarding and managing a team and using VAs and understanding your own financials. So we'll talk about that in another show. But for now, if accountants want to think more like entrepreneurs, what are some of the things that you've learned in your journey, Nathan, that they should be thinking about? Yeah. So to me, it's all about a repeatable process. If you get a lead and that's the beginning, someone hears about your bookkeeping business, they're referred to you, they shoot you an email, a text, whatever it is. What is the actual process that they follow from the point they, they make contact with you to the point where you're on a good monthly process. And then that monthly process needs to be repeatable every single month. So for example, for us, you get a lead and they have the option to grab one of our free lead magnets that we have all over our website. We've got agendas, we've got case studies, we've got sample reports. People can see what we're all about, what our story is. They can hop on a call if they want to. And next step is filling out a pricing form. We have a form that takes one minute to fill out, gets us some, some information. They give us access to their current book. So that's the process they follow. Our pricing team gets them a quote. The quote is two parts, upfront cost for setup, catch up, cleanup, fixed price for monthly going forward. We send the client the quote, answer their questions, hop on another call if they want. Next step, they agree to the quote. They add a payment method. We charge them for the upfront. After that, we do what we call integration, where we get all the access we need so we don't have to ask them for stuff down the line. We have someone who's just in charge of that. And then once we get all the documents, view only access, everything's connected to QuickBooks, they have a kickoff call with our team so we can make sure that we're all on the same page. And we get we have a timeline from that kickoff call, 60 days, 90 days, whatever it is, for us to do whatever that catch-up cleanup work is. And we keep the client updated every Thursday. Every single week, the client gets an update. This is what we've accomplished so far. This is what's left until we finally submit the updated catch-up cleanup. And then they're on monthly going forward. By the 15th of every month, they get their reports from us. So for us, it's repeatable. It doesn't matter where the client comes from, what the client looks like. They talk to us if they want. They get a pricing quote. They accept it. They go through integration. They have a kickoff call. They get updated through catch-up cleanup. They get on monthly going forward. And then we have check-ins along the way. How's your experience? How's it working with your bookkeeper? We're not waiting. We're being proactive. We're not waiting for them to have some kind of issue. So you got to figure out your own process, but it should be the same for every client. I've seen a lot of bookkeepers that for integration, for example, they'll get a few things up front, but then they'll ask for stuff later. And then they'll ask for stuff later again. And it's a very clunky, not smooth process for the client that doesn't value their time. And all of our processes are designed to value the client's time at the highest possible level. So you've given us an insight there on life as an entrepreneur and some of the things you're thinking about. So I'm asking you, how can accounting professionals and put bookkeepers, CPAs in that box? How can they think more entrepreneurially to get inside your world and help you more? So first, they've got to see your business as a, a, a group of systems, processes, repeatable tasks like that. That helps them understand your world a little bit more. What else? Yeah, I mean, hiring and delegating is a, a big key. It's one of the reasons we started Outsource School. I mean, you, you can't do everything. I, from this process that I, I laid out, like these are different teams. I've got salespeople. I got a pricing person. I got an integration person. I got a catch-up cleanup team. And then I got monthly bookkeepers. And you can, when you're small, you don't need to start off hiring five people, but you you can't do it all yourself. You can't be doing the kickoff calls and the pricing and the integration and the monthly books. You want, If you want to think like an entrepreneur, you need to hire people for those positions and the skill set's very different the person who helps a client through integration doesn't have the same skill set as the catch-up person doesn't have the same skill set as someone hopping on the kickoff call and actually communicating face-to-face -face with the client so 
<laughs> figuring out what is what are you good at? Are you good at the catch up cleanup? Are you good at lending the clients? Um, and fig and figuring out what people you hire around you that you can fit into your business to make sure clients are talking to the right people at the right point with the right experience. That's what thinking like an entrepreneur is all about. And that delegation is key. And that's what makes you scalable. That's where a lot of bookkeepers or just entrepreneurs aren't able to get past six figures or get to seven figures because they're they're not surrounding themselves with the right kind of talent to, to move on to the next level. Okay, time out from the recording. My bad for asking this in the wrong way, but I've confused two different issues here in the questioning. I'm thinking we'd do two shows and the first show would be how can it, CPAs and bookkeepers be more entrepreneurial to help business owners like you in their professional roles. The second recording I was planning on doing is for those accountants that want to stop being an employed accountant in a public accounting firm or a bookkeeper in a public accounting firm, how can they start their own business and now become an entrepreneur and do the onboarding and the VAs and the processes and everything else. So in your answers, which are great, we've mixed up two things. Got it. So your first question, I guess I'm confused. Are you asking me that if I had an accountant, me as the client, what can the accountant do to help me as an entrepreneur? Kind of. And I'm thinking accountants in being trusted advisors, they shouldn't just do what you tell them to do. They should be asking you great questions. They should be understanding what a business owner and entrepreneur does. They should be flagging up things that you don't know. They should be understanding your repeatable processes and, and all the things that you have to do. But accountants are not business owners, Nathan. You know that. They're employed professionals. They don't own a business, a lot of them. Some of them do. But some of them just take a paycheck and they do chargeable hours and they do the audit and the tax returns and everything else. And they don't think like businesses. And it frustrates a lot of entrepreneurs that they don't. So I was trying to get into the skin. And if there's not a show in there, if there's not really a story there, we can just forget that and talk about the entrepreneurial accountant that wants to do their own thing and transition from being that employed person to sailing their own ship. No, I got it. Give me one more shot. Let's do it. Well, it's the two shows, or just should we just focus on one? It's up to you. Whatever you want to do. Okay. Well, we've got so far in this one. Let's see if we can make one show out of this and and piece together the almost those two sections of how can accountants serve businesses and entrepreneurs better by thinking more like them. There's that aspect. And then I'd, I'll ask you, well, let's say an accountant wants to go out on his own. They don't want to take a paycheck anymore. They don't want to do their own thing, Nathan. What should they be thinking about? Are we okay with that? Yep. And we'll just make it one recording. Okay. Terrific. So, Nathan, if accountants want to help businesses better, they need to think like business owners. They need to think like entrepreneurs. Accountants, unless they run their own firm, they're not necessarily business owners. They are employed people, they're part of a bigger corporate structure, and they've got to speak into the life of a business. Have you got any advice for them to think more like the business clients that they serve and help those entrepreneurs and clients do better? Yeah, I mean, I think it starts with that initial kickoff call. That's something that we value a lot and really listening to the client and what they care about. Every client cares about something different. Some people are entrepreneurs for the first time and they're totally lost and, and they need help just understanding an income statement, balance sheet and cash flow. Other people, they're trying to scale. So they're trying to figure out what are areas of their business that they can improve on, what, what direction is their margin going, how much hiring they can do. You might be able to refer a CFO or someone to project out cash flow or project out sales into the future. Um, other people might be looking for an exit down the line and you need to prepare them for that and get them thinking the right mentality of how their report should look to get the highest possible evaluation down the line. And, and by really listing the client and what their needs are and understanding that those needs might change over time and every quarter, every half year, every year, checking in with them and seeing where they're at, what they're thinking, what's important to them. And to me, that's the key to, to really understanding your clients and helping them be an entrepreneur and going above and beyond, not necessarily uh, being reactive where a client says, hey, what about this? Can you tell me more about this? But on your side, looking out for them and, and saying, hey, 
there's a, a change to the tax code that, that I should bring to your attention that, that we should talk about, or, hey, you're getting to the point where it makes sense to, to talk about being an S-corp or set up a retirement account and start putting money away. Like there, there's different things that you can be proactive on and checking with your clients every single month. And there might be certain custom reports that certain clients want that other clients don't. And by talking to the client and seeing what numbers are important to them, what they're trying to do, you're going to be able to customize the experience to, to better fit them, which will allow you to, to charge more and also just add more value to, to them as an entrepreneur. Adding more value, charging more are great things for an accountant, a CPA, or even a bookkeeper to hear, but, but you've got to be adding more value. I love your emphasis on proactivity. You don't just sit back and do the books and do the accounts. You flag up problems. You, It's okay saying listen more, but you've got to be curious and ask questions. And talk about what you're going and where you're going and what your vision is and give you suggestions on the back of that. And, and some accountants don't do that so well. Yeah, I, I think a lot of bookkeepers and accountants are, are very reactive. Um, it definitely depends on the, the culture of the business that they're in. But I mean, you should start thinking of it as like, what 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 are the check-in points? Like how often are you checking with this client? Even if this client never reaches out to you and you're the only part, you're reaching out to them for tax information at the end of the year, whatever it is, what are the different points of the year that you should be reaching out saying, hey, this is what we should be aware of. This is what we should be focused on at this point of the year. Um, stuff like that. Just getting into that proactive approach with all your clients. And that overall is going to help you. It's going to lead to, to more business. It's one of those things you don't necessarily know what they need unless you ask, unless you're proactive and you follow up mm. what about the accountant that is a real entrepreneur they are employed they've got the qualification they've gone into a firm because they feel that's the right thing to do for their career path they've got some experience in the trenches working for someone else and serving a portfolio of clients but they've got that itch nathan that you had at university they want to do their own thing they want to be their own boss but they've got a salary to replace. They might be earning five, $6,000 a year. They've got to replace their healthcare. They've got to replace that income pretty quickly and get up and running. What kind of processes, questions are they going through to turn from employed to a, a self-employed person? So this is kind of this is a process that, that I follow. Um, I'm, the first step we can kind of skip. It's all about identifying a, a business that has a big market. Obviously, okay. bookkeeping already has a big market, so you're already there. The next is figuring out what niche you're going to serve because you don't want to be a bookkeeper for everyone. You don't want to serve e-commerce and agencies and real estate. Hopefully, you've got a niche or two that that you can be really focused on. And down the line, if you're crushing it and you want to expand, you can. But it's always good to, to pick that one niche that you can specialize in. From there, it's market research. Who are the competitors in your space? Who are the local bookkeepers around you in the same niche? When you Google, let's say, e-commerce bookkeeping, who comes up? You want to get to know their competitors, how they charge, what they offer, what they don't offer, and if possible, talk to the, their clients or ideal clients and figure out what they like about them. Can they recognize any competitors in the space? Stuff like that. You want as much information as possible. From there, you want to budget. You want to figure out, hey, if I was going to start this thing, who do I have to hire? What software am I going to have to use? What is it going to cost me per month? So you know how much money you're going to put in. If you if it's going to cost you $2,500 every month and you're going to put in 10K, well, you got four months to find some clients or you're going to run out of money. So doing those projections are, are very important. And then my personal favorite that I think a lot of people overlook, and it's really the best strategy if you're going to try to do a slow transition out of a, a corporate job, launch with a minimum viable product. Start with one service, whether it's tax returns, monthly books, consulting, whatever it is, and see if you can give it away for free. And you're going to do this strategically. For us, we gave away two months of free bookkeeping to old clients in our other companies. Now, we didn't just say, hey, I'm going to work with you for free. We put them through our pricing process. We got them a quote, and that quote kicks in by month three. So their first two months are free. It's a good deal for them. We set the expectation, hey, we're new. We're going to do things wrong. We're going to break stuff. We want feedback. We want to know what you like and don't like about our service. So they're on the same page. And try to land five to 10 clients. And if you can't land five to 10 clients, giving it away for free, that's probably a, a, a reference that you need to change some things on the front end, either your niche or how you're marketing, whatever it is. Or on the flip side, if you get those 10 clients and after two months, all those clients leave you and none of them are paying, that's another sign to, to kind of go back to the drawing board. But it, usually if you do it properly, you can use those initial clients to get feedback, improve the process, 
Those initial clients are, are going to be along with you for the ride. And it gives you a few months, no pressure to figure everything out, hire people, get your systems in order before really launching it and maybe quitting your job. Mm -hmm. That's very good. Accountants, finance people, bookkeepers, by nature are risk averse. Entrepreneurs are risk takers. So there's a lot to give up a secure paycheck. There's a lot of skills you don't have, like winning business and winning new clients that you perhaps not developed in your role. So are you thinking of a side hustle to just maybe put one foot in a new world to see whether you've got it, Nathan? Are you a fan of that? Doing two jobs at once? I'm a fan of it. I mean, it's tough for, for me personally to relate because I've never had a, a real job outside of some college internships and right. um, and stuff like that. But I will say when I had my college internship, I kept it while I was running my Amazon business for, for a good six months until it really got off the ground. And I was making more money on my phone on the internship selling on Amazon than I was at the actual internship. And then I quit. And I'm always a fan of backup plans and options. Like when I graduated, even after that, I had full-time job offers. I'd spent the time to apply and interview. And then I had a decision to make. Do I take the steady job or do I take a risk and, and become an entrepreneur? And then you got to look at, at other factors. Like I was young at the time. I didn't have a, a family. I didn't have role like responsibilities or bills or anything. So pretty good time to, to take risk. If you're 50 years old and you've got a wife and kids, you might want to hang on to that job for a little longer and play it a little bit safer. But the, the beauty of just the time we live in is it's not like you need $100,000 to start your own bookkeeping or, or CPA practice. Like you can run the business remote. You can run it with pr pretty lean, minimum software, minimum viable product. You can test it a lot before you really make that commitment to make sure it works without sacrificing your life savings or, or anything like that. There are so many new opportunities for accountants to serve business owners out there. And you're a specialist in the e-commerce and digital businesses, Nathan. These are jobs that probably didn't exist 10, 15, 20 years ago, but Amazon and platforms like that have changed the game. Talk about some of the opportunities out there to serve this kind of community. Yeah, I mean, there, there's so many opportunities with different niches. I mean, if you focus on agency owners or e-commerce businesses or franchises, like you can go down the line and figure out what makes sense for you and and look at the, the competition. I mean, there, there are Facebook groups of all one types of businesses, like Facebook groups for, for SaaS owners. And if you build a kind of partnership where you're the go-to bookkeeper for that particular Facebook group or that community, that can be pretty lucrative. I'll, I'll give an example. Um, I have a, a friend of mine who runs an insurance business. Insurance pretty boring. There's a lot of insurance agents out there, right? But what they did is they focused on Amazon sellers. They only provide insurance for Amazon sellers and they became the go-to insurance provider for the Amazon seller community and got referrals in there because other insurance providers offer the same insurance, but they weren't niched down. So you have opportunities like that to, to pick a niche and really focus on it and be the go-to person in that niche. And let's say that you pick Let's say that you pick pet product, like pet businesses. That's your niche for whatever reason. Find every pet podcast out there and try to get on that podcast. Try to network with all the pet trainers. Like try try to get in with all the, the pet product people. Like th that, that might sound like a silly one, but that's how you got to think is where, where does my niche hang out and how do I connect with every single person in that space? I had a story about a couple of uh, financial wealth advisors. One had picked a niche in BMX bikers. Do you know those? Do you have BMX in the US? Yeah, yeah, we definitely do. Right. So he just went along to the track meets and, and these events and started to get to know them and join the Facebook groups. Another joined a Facebook group of furriers. I don't know if you call them furriers over there, but these are the guys, the blacksmiths that shoe horses. And he made a whole niche in that. This is here in the United Kingdom. So uh, that idea of niching is brave. It's courageous because you're not saying I'm going to do business with everyone, but you're saying this is going to be my crowd and you become that go-to person for them, don't you? Right, exactly. And I mean, stuff spreads. Your your name becomes uh, the, the go-to person in that space and you become an expert on it and people look up to you for that. So what, what are the down, challenges in one of the challenges in starting your own thing, Nathan, is quickly realizing that as the in going from an employed position to doing your own thing, you can't do it all yourself. What you have become very good at 
is that outsourcing piece, that VA piece, that virtual assistant. Talk to us about some of the decisions there in making your first hire or outsourcing. Yeah, so there's three kinds of, of people that you can hire. You've got the followers, the doers, and the experts. So okay. the followers, they're your virtual assistants or, or employees. They have their own skill set. Like you're not teaching someone bookkeeping from the ground up or customer service from the ground up. You're looking for someone with customer service experience, but you're teaching them how you want it done. You're teaching them your systems, your process. They're there to, to follow that. You don't just hire someone for lead generation and say, go find me leads. You need a lead generation process for, for that follower to, to follow. And if you hire a VA if from the Philippines, they're in that five to 10 bucks an hour. Then you've got the, the doers, the specialists, graph designers, web developers, writers. They're there to do that one specific task. They do the same thing eight, 10 hours a day. You're not teaching a graphic designer how to be a graphic designer, but they're not consulting with you either. And the beauty of this is you can build up a Rolodex of reliable doers that you can take business to business. If I need a graphic design project today, I'm not posting a job on Upwork. I have a bunch of graphic designers I've worked with in the past 10 years, and I'm just going to them for that particular project. And that's a very powerful tool. And then you got the experts. And as an entrepreneur, as a bookkeeper, you're, you're probably only good at one or two things. Maybe you're good at sales. Maybe you're good at cleanup work. Maybe you're good at monthly work. And you can't master everything. You can't take a course on every possible thing. So you're going to have to hire an expert to do all the things that, that you're not good at, whether it's marketing or in my case, I'm not a bookkeeper. So I'm running a bookkeeping business. I need different bookkeepers and controllers. So that's kind of how you have to think of it as an entrepreneur. And before you make any hire, before you start a business, you need to think, hey, do I need a follower, a doer, an expert? Or how many followers do I need? How, what doers do I need? What expert do I need? What am I, am I, am I really going to run a business in 2023 without a website? Probably not. So I probably need to hire a web developer uh, before I get started. So that's a good mentality to, to get into. That's really good. And many entrepreneurs, business owners, particularly starting out, they want to do it all themselves because they've got control. They don't want to yield that to anyone else. But it's important for entrepreneurs to delegate, isn't it? It's so important. It, there's very few seven-figure entrepreneurs out there uh, that, that don't know how to delegate, that are just doing it themselves. If you want to grow, you've got to be able to hire and delegate. Are there any hiring mistakes you've seen people make over the years, Nathan? So many. So when we hire someone, we look for the trifecta of skill, attitude, and communication. And I think a lot of people, they just hire for skill. This person's got 10 years of bookkeeping experience, and then it blows up in their face and they wonder why. And we already talked a little bit about communication, but attitude is just as important. We want someone who doesn't only care about money, someone who's going to treat my clients well and not make me look bad. Someone who I would just want to get a beer with after, after work. Like those are the kind of people that, that we look for. And then when you hire someone, you want to spend extra time setting expectations up front. You want to know what they're get, get they want to know what they're getting into. You want to make sure that you know uh, that they know how you communicate, what's going to be expected from them output wise. Because you, there's so many situations where you'll hire someone and two months in, they realize. They don't actually want what the job entails. So you'd rather that they back out because they know the real expectations and they're not a fit than to, to figure that out after you've invested time, money, and energy uh, down the line. So those are just a few. We actually teach how to avoid all those mistakes in outsource school, but make sure you're setting good expectations and making sure you're, you're hiring people with skill, attitude, and communication. And outsource school seems like a good idea for professionals that want to do their own thing and have to transition out of that employed role into doing it themselves. There's so much they got to think about. What do you do there, Nathan, in outsource school? Yeah, so we teach people our hiring process. We have a unique way that we interview, onboard, train, and manage people. Everything from our interview questions to how we set expectations up front to how we run meetings to how we fire people. All of it's laid in there that you can just plug into your business and then all of our SOPs are in there as a bonus, standard operating procedures. So if you're trying to get on podcasts, we have an SOP on pitching podcasts. If you're trying to hire someone to run customer service for your bookkeeping business, we have an SOP on that. So all these different things, you can pick and choose what you want to plug into your business. But the, the hiring piece is so important. If you're good at hiring and you have a 95% plus success rate hiring, that's a game changer in your business. Bad hiring costs you time, money, hassle. It makes you not want to be an entrepreneur anymore. So everything that we know about hiring is in outsource school. And with the hiring thing, you're not talking about bringing people into the business in on the payroll 
you're talking about the whole outsource model, aren't you? Where essentially you don't even employ anybody. Yeah, I mean, you can use it both ways. Like we hire a lot of VAs. Outsource School is designed for virtual assistants, but we've got members who take our hiring process and use it to hire full-time employees. We do it for that too. Like we have a controller in the US that we hired for our bookkeeping business. And we use the same thing on on her with a few tweaks, but it's pretty much the same same process. So it's just a good hiring process that you can pick and choose how you want to use it. Nathan, this has been a great insight into the mind of an entrepreneur and the the things that employed accountants bookkeepers need to think about if they're going to make that transition into sailing their own ship would you leave us with a few uh words of advice about what's coming up in the future because we know the world is changing we know these are crazy times if we were to sit together and talk about what an entrepreneur looks like in five ten years time talk to us about how the outsource model and the different ways of thinking are going to play out yeah, it's funny. I feel like I'm the worst at predicting the future. Like if you had asked me <laughs> 10 years ago if I'd be selling baby products or running a freelance marketplace, or even three years ago, if you told me I'd be running a bookkeeping business, I probably wouldn't have believed you. Um, but obviously, like outsourcing is a factor. AI is like the popular word right now. That's a factor. Um, you got climate change and everything that's involved with that. So, I mean, there, there's lots of stuff to just be aware of. But w- that's kind of my favorite thing about being in a big market like bookkeeping is like an AI competitor could come out and take half the market away from us bookkeepers. But there's still so many clients that need bookkeeping, that want a one-on-one bookkeeper that you can offer a custom service for. So stay up to date on what's going on. But I I wouldn't necessarily like, I don't know, it's tough to predict is is my take. (laughs) Well, it it is tough to predict, but you've given us a lot of insights and clarity into the world that's out there. Nathan Hirsch, it's been really enjoyable talking to you. Thanks so much for your time today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This was fun, and, and hopefully your audience got a lot of value out of it. And if, oh, you, sure. if anyone wants to connect with me, just find me on LinkedIn, uh, Nathan Hirsch. We'll put all your contact details in our show notes. Thanks a lot, Nathan. Thank you.